From the bubonic plague ravaging the U.S. city in the 20th century to border patrol agents bathing immigrants in gasoline, here are seven dark events in history that shouldn't be true, but are. The bubonic plague ravaged San Francisco in the 1900s. Everyone knows about the 14th century Black Death that decimated the world's population, but many people are unaware that this plague also surfaced in the United States and lasted for four years. It was first discovered by medical professionals in 1900, but California's governor, Henry Gage, denied it for over two years. The plague was spreading through San Francisco's Chinatown, and the city did its best to contain the outbreak and let as little information about it out as possible. What little information about the outbreak did get out was used against the Chinese residents of the town, contributing the disease to them being unclean. There were 121 confirmed cases of the bubonic plague, and it resulted in 119 deaths. Had it not been for the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, the plague of San Francisco probably would have been more remembered. The death of Roger Williamson at the 1973 Dutch Grand Prix. Roger Williamson was a promising young race car driver from the UK. He was a two-time British Formula 3 champion who had just made his debut in Formula 1. Two weeks after his first race at the British Grand Prix, Williamson was competing in the Dutch Grand Prix. On the eighth lap, one of his tires failed and caused his March 731 to hit the barriers at high speed and catapulted the car 300 yards across the track, landing upside down. The gas tank had been scraping across the ground, which caused it to ignite. Williamson was not seriously injured in the crash, but he couldn't get out of the car. He was trapped. The race didn't stop, but continued with a local yellow. A fellow driver, David Purley, stopped his car and attempted to help Williamson where he could hear Williamson screaming for him to get him out of the blazing car. Purley tried as hard as he could to free Williamson, but he couldn't do so by himself and as the marshals were not wearing fire-resistant suits, they couldn't assist either. They also only had one fire extinguisher. Since no one else stopped to help Purley, and the track staff were ill-equipped to handle accidents, Williamson died of asphyxiation after burning alive for 10 minutes. A blanket was placed over the car with Williamson's body still inside, and the race carried on as usual. And unfortunately, Roger Williamson's death wasn't the only one in the 1973 season, as French driver Francois Saver, who finished second in the Dutch Grand Prix, died in qualification for the United States Grand Prix just a few months later. Soviet Cannibal Island In 1933, Russia deported around 6,700 prisoners from Moscow and Leningrad who were unable to obtain international passports to a special settlement on Nazino Island. They were dumped off on the island with minimal supplies of flour for food, little to no tools, and no clothing needed to survive the harsh, cold Siberian weather. As you can imagine, conditions on the island went south quickly. Most of the inhabitants were from the city, so they knew nothing about growing their own food. The lack of supplies quickly led to gangs being formed so they could prey on other settlers to steal their supplies. There were frequent fights over food and supplies, which often led to murder. The guards also began to terrorize the settlers, executing people for committing minor offenses. Anyone caught trying to leave the island was killed on sight as well. And to add on to that, cannibalism became pretty widespread pretty quickly. Finally, in June 1933, the remaining survivors were transported to smaller islands and the Nazino experiment was ended. Roughly 3,800 people had died on the island. And what's even crazier is that the experiment only lasted about 13 weeks. The Suffragist Night of Suffering In November 1917, while peacefully protesting for women's right to vote outside the White House, 33 women were arrested and sent to a prison called the Occoquan Workhouse. The suffragists demanded to be treated as political prisoners, but the prison superintendent, William H. Whitaker, had another idea. He ordered his guards to torture them. The guards burst into their holding cell and dragged all of the women to some dark and disgusting cells down the hall. Some of the women were chained to the ceiling, forcing them to stand or hang all night. Others were thrown around and bashed into iron furniture. 
One woman became so distraught at the torture, believing that one of her cellmates had been murdered, that she had a heart attack and was denied medical care until the next morning. In late November, the women were finally released from prison. In 1918, the DC Court of Appeals ruled that the women had been illegally detained. President Woodrow Wilson then called on Congress to act on the Federal Suffrage Amendment. The 19th Amendment, which allowed women the right to vote, was finally passed in 1919. Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire In 1911 in Manhattan, New York, one of the deadliest industrial disasters in U.S. history occurred. The Triangle Waste Company factory was located on the 8th, 9th, and 10th stories of the Ash Building in the Greenwich Village neighborhood of New York City. About 500 workers, who were mostly Italian and Jewish women ranging in age from 14 to 25, were working their 9-hour shift making shirtwaists. It was Saturday, March 25, 1911, and as the workday was coming to an end, a small fire started up in a trash can under one of the cutter's tables on the 8th floor due to an improperly discarded cigarette. Smoking was banned in the factory, but that didn't stop employees from lighting up the occasional cigarette in secret. Unfortunately, no one noticed the fire until it had been burning for about 5 minutes, and being in a factory filled with fabrics, everything was highly flammable. The secretary on the 8th floor phoned the 10th floor to warn them of the fire, but there was no alarm or phone on the 9th floor. Employees were locked in on their respective floors as a way for management to keep them from taking unauthorized breaks. The elevators in the building became overheated and could not be used, and the firefighters' ladders could only reach as high as the 7th floor. Some employees tried to evacuate on the fire escapes, but the fire melted the iron and caused about 20 workers to plunge 100 feet to their death on the concrete below. Other employees attempted to jump to safety, but also met the same fate. Some landed on an iron fence below and were impaled. The rest were doomed to wait until the smoke and flames overtook them. 146 people died in the fire. The owners of the company were initially charged with manslaughter for locking the doors that doomed their employees, but they were later acquitted. Gasoline Baths at the U.S.-Mexican Border In 1917, border authorities in El Paso, Texas began a new process of disinfecting all immigrants who entered the United States through the U.S.-Mexican border. They would strip down the immigrants, inspect them for lice and other visible infections, then burn their clothes. If they were found to have lice, they'd be shaved head to toe, then doused in vinegar and kerosene. They thought this was a way to cleanse them. They would receive a ticket proving that they were clean, but they would still be required to go through the same procedure every eight days. Border guards were also found to be taking explicit photos of women during these inspections. A few days after the new process began, one woman who crossed the border for work refused to go through this inhumane process, which sparked a protest by thousands of other Mexicans at the border. The woman, 17-year-old Carmelita Torres, was imprisoned and never heard from again. Many protesters were publicly executed as well. The baths continued for several years, even with authorities using cyanide-based pesticides in lieu of gasoline. More than 100,000 Mexicans were given these harmful baths before it was officially deemed a dangerous practice in the 1960s and the process was shut down. Unfortunately, Germany took inspiration from this barbaric practice and in 1937 began using this in their camps. The Children's Blizzard The winter of 1887 to 1888 was unforgiving and relentless for the Great Plains region of the United States. From November through January, there were many snowstorms, sub-zero temperatures, sleet, ice storms, and heavy blankets of snow piled up everywhere. Some places had up to 40 inches of snow. The residents of this area couldn't wait for spring to come to relieve them of their winter blues. On the morning of January 12, 1888, they were met with a pleasant surprise. The air was warm, the sun was bright, and it looked like the treacherous winter was finally moving out. Children went to school mostly wearing short sleeves because of how nice the weather was. However, while they were in school, the warm temps suddenly turned frigid. The lowest recorded temperature that day was negative 56 degrees Fahrenheit. The snow accumulated fast, and it was very hard to see where you were going due to the intense blizzard. Many children, especially those who lived on farms, ventured out into the harsh blizzard and almost all of them got lost and died in the snow. 
There were 235 deaths in total, with most of them being children. To this day, this is still the world's 10th deadliest winter storm on record. That's all for today. Thanks for tuning in to another video. Please feel free to voluntarily commit yourself to Asinine Asylum by hitting that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you can be first in line for more true and fascinating horror stories like this. It's farewell for now, my patients. I'll see you in the next video.